All right, we're live again with the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Those of you who don't recognize the gentleman before me today, he is Deacon Mihrat Malaku, the mercy of the angel, my dear younger brother. And he is, uh, maybe to his chagrin, he's going to get to hear me praise him a little bit on the forefront. If you go through my YouTube channel, you can find the talks that him and I have done on faith and on Pascha, which is the Orthodox Christian way of saying the Easter or the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the surrounding holidays before and after that. So there are numerous occasions where he is going to be a repeat guest on religious matters. At the same time, he's a concert pianist. And so in order for you all to get acculturated more, we're going to bring him back for other episodes to teach you and to go in depth about classical music. But none of that is the subject of today. The subject of today is speech and debate and a club dedicated to dialogue that he formed. So let's begin with a a hello, Deacon Mirat, and why don't you introduce us to how you got into the world of speech and debate? Well, uh, first, thank you very much, Brother Hanok, for bringing me onto this platform and inviting me. Um, I don't know if I would call myself a concert pianist. That's too big of a title. But uh, I appreciate everything. Please correct uh, me. Give me the give me the correct title. I want to give you <laughs> Derbaba Kawuk, Derbaba Praise. Not too much, not too little. Perfect. Yeah, he's uh, pianist. I like that. Just someone who plays piano. Um, In but, concerts or no? Occasionally. <laughs> recitals, we call them. Recitals, but, okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so speech and debate, my experience in uh, high school um, is very limited. I only took one year of speech and debate. Uh, I had taken two years of speech and debate in middle school, seventh and eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And so I uh, was very excited to enter debate. I took it for a year. It was a very nice experience. And then onwards from that, as you yourself had mentioned, 10th and 11th, I formed uh, a club for civil discourse. And I kind of feel like those stories are kind of interconnected. They have uh, something in common. Yeah, that's that's essentially my experience in terms of duration or time. Yeah. So what were the forms of so speech and debate? You know, there's so many different types and forms within that. Could you get into a little bit about what at your school were the types in middle school and high school that were available to you and then what you ended up choosing and and why you got into it and then maybe why you left? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, when I was in middle school, um, there was only one form of debate that was open to people in my school and they called it MSPDP, middle school public debate. Uh, uh, I think some, something like that. It was created by this professor from, I think Claremont McKenna, which is not far from where we're based. Uh, and it's a, a derivation of parliamentary debate. Okay. With just shorter duration and time. And, Three person and as opposed to two person teams. Meaning, meaning, yeah, three on three. Yeah, three Six on three. Two on two. Yeah. Uh, and then after I finished eighth grade, culminated, and I was uh, transitioning into high school. There were three options that our high school presented to us. So we have uh, parliamentary, which is I think probably the most popular format of debate. Then you have public forum, and then there, we had Lincoln Douglas. Uh, the other popular format that was not available to us was policy, um, and that that that's its own world, to be honest. But uh, I ended up choosing um, LD Lincoln Douglas because you know in middle school and really throughout my whole life I was very interested in philosophy. I loved philosophy a lot. You know I read a lot of philosophy. Um, I still do, and so I heard that LD was one of the more philosophical um, formats of debate that they tended to go more into that. Whereas the other two kind of were more on policy. So I ended up choosing that. And that's, as you know, it's a one-on-one format. Um, Which is interesting compared to the team formats that we just discussed, the two-on-two versus the three-on-three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. What What do you What do you think of the merits of one-on-one versus two-on-two versus three-on-three? And the you know the kind of planning and preparation phase, like how much planning and preparation do you get once you hear about what the topic of debate will be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's an interesting thing. Um, the preparation also is very enticing to me, although I learned later on that it might not be so enticing. But uh, we can talk about that later on. 
but uh, I think if I am correct, for parliamentary, they give you the topic 30 minutes, right, before uh, debating. For LD, I believe you get like a month of preparation by yourself. Uh, and that's part of the thing. LD is more of an evidence-based kind of like, you know, you're accumulating a, a bunch of things. Parliamentary, at, at least ideally, is supposed to be more based on reasoning. Um, another thing about LD is I think if you're someone that likes to not rely on anyone else but yourself, <laughs> kind of like independent, kind of a lone wolf kind of thing, right? Like yeah. you're a maverick. Whereas parliamentary is if you have someone that you have like a really good bond with, that you know you can work well with, it's kind of like a a demonstration of ensemble unity, you know, like. Yeah, I had the most disorganized. I was a parliamentary debater in college and I judged high school debate. And when I was, uh, I, I, I judged for Lincoln Douglas before, which by the way, for those who can't tell, famously named after the, the speeches between eventual President Lincoln and his adversary, Douglas. But I, I was in parliamentary debate and we had about 20, 30 minutes of prep, like you said. So it's like you're you're being very reactionary and you're reasoning on the fly. So it helps that what uh, our our blessed Bishop Barnabas refers to as Yazera Fatimurt, where someone asks you to to teach or speak on a certain topic and you just, you know, you're ready to go, which means you have to be well read on a number of subjects, like a, a form of a, a generalist. But it's interesting. I had many different partners. Part of that is that I spent a semester in DC. Part of that is I didn't begin till I was a junior in college. So I, it was very weird and uh, disgruntled. It's almost like each semester I had a different partner where typically, you know, you, you build a bond, you find somebody, you build a bond, like you said, and then you're able to, to get in the flow and the rhythm once you're a year, two years, maybe three years into your partner relationship. And I never had the option to go solo, but I always wondered how far could I have gone had I had I gone the the solo route, yeah, I, I mean it's very interesting. I learned um, when I, in my year of debate in high school, um, you know, in some parts of the country, particularly the West Coast, where you have this, and I think we'll get into this this uh, idea of flow debate. Um, they have this thing called tag teaming, where your partner can stand up in the middle of your speech and say a point that they have, like you can let them speak while you're speaking, uh, and vice versa, and you can see how destructive that could be if you're not on the same page. But I mean, the more of, you know, bond you have, then the more fluid it can be. Like, you know, the minds kind of just become one and you're just passing on, uh, you know, what you have to say. So that's just really one of the things that makes parliamentary different from LD. Yeah, there's a early economic insight that even if you're better than somebody, at doing task A or B, if you're both doing it together, as opposed to you trying to do both of them by yourself, you know, there's this idea that the reason civilization and societies form is because there's something better. There's at least potential to be better when you have two people. So you're absolutely right there. There's, there's that potential. It's just a matter of whether or not you're fulfilling that potential in any instantiation where where you're actually debating. So what what type of topics, do you remember any any of the topics that you all used to get into and and maybe let us know if it intersected at all with any of the philosophy that you were reading? I know you're a voracious yeah. reader. Um, you know, I don't really remember specifically, but like, you know, topics, but what I do remember is um, they were, as you may know, there are, I believe, three types of resolutions in debate, right? There is um, value topics, there is uh, policy topics. Uh, I forgot the third one. It was um, kind of like a true or false, like fact topics. I forgot what mm -hmm. the formal name is. But in LD, the topics you get are value, meaning ideally they're based in the moral world. You have to argue for why something ought to be as opposed to why something should be. Although... Again, I like to use the term ideally because in LD nowadays, um, that kind of has transitioned into policy. Um, but there's a lot of philosophical ground you can cover with these topics. Like, you know, let's say you have a topic on euthanasia, uh -huh. talk, you know, talking about the different philosophies on the sacredness of life, um, talking about the issue, like the idea of consent. What does consent even mean? Um, you know, it covers so many things, you know, ontology, epistemology, um, 
different things, social contract. You can in, you can involve so many different things. Um, when okay, just- so that brings up a good point because I remember in parliamentary debate, you never knew whether you were going to be assigned because you are assigned either the affirmative or the negative. Did you ever end up having to play devil's advocate or rather advocating for or reasoning and providing evidence for things that you did not believe for the sake of the activity? Oh, of course. I mean, they give you one topic, you go to a tournament, there's probably five rounds. So uh, it's not a question of uh, if, right? It's a question of when. You're going to play both sides. You have to prepare both sides. And you're going to, you know, you're going to say yes one time, no one time, yes one time. So, I mean, obviously, I, if you're going to uh, defend both sides, then there's a 100% chance you're going to defend something you don't believe in. Uh but I think the, the key is understanding that it's an intellectual activity. It's like an activity of training and exercising the mind to look at different perspectives. I don't think anyone in that room, whether it's the person arguing or the judge, you know, actually believes that these are things that the person personally is defending. But just like a lawyer, you know, you defend some people you may not want to defend, but it's just the idea of being able to come up with arguments to see why it's understandable to accept that topic, you know? See, I, I love that. And the devil's advocate that I mentioned is a lawyer, right? It's It was an official position in the Roman right at one point. And the idea behind it is this idea that my philosophy professor in college, in my undergraduate studies, used to actually always tell us. He says, if you have confidence in your ideas, in your beliefs, in your argumentation, you don't want to beat up a straw man. You want to build an Iron Man. You want to build the most powerful argument possible for your opponent. Because if your arguments are still potent in the strongest form of your opponent's argument, then that's going to make them all the better. If all they're doing is is defeating straw men, you don't really know what the potency or the power of your argumentation is. So yeah, I I love that practice of, of playing both sides. It's like, you know, some, some people call it what the intercourse of ideas like ideas getting together with ideas and 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 those ideas then having babies and the ideas to produce hopefully the best set of ideas from this environment and then like you said just train yourself in in the system of of getting used to this so this all sounds great and and we're going to get to maybe where it it was not so great mm-hmm. but what i see from this activity is one of two things that I I never was able to pin down whether it's nature or whether it's nurture, whether it's in our blood and our biology or whether it's something learned. I see this producing, or at least uh, people being drawn to, you know, depending on where you go on that debate, neutrality, which I think leads to your later, you know, your later desire to form a club on civil discourse. But I find myself to be very neutral. I find myself, um, you know, I'm obviously more opinionated and specific in terms of religion, but in terms of like politics and history, I often see people trying to force a dichotomy or a binary, two choices. And I'm always like, you know, it's not, the world is not Coke or Pepsi. It's such a tiny Overton window that people often present us. And I'm saying there's so many more options. There's so much more nuance. And I ended up seeing not just good and evil cartoon and villain, but gray, a lot more gray in the world. And I, and I'm wondering, do you think that you have an inherent like biological neutrality that drew you to the activity of debate? Or do you think that it bred neutrality in you? Or am I off base here? What do you mean by neutrality? I just want to make sure that I, we're on the same page. So after- I think most people we encounter mm-hmm. would not be able to provide intelligent evidence for a position they did not believe in. You and I were just talking about the ability multiple times within a given weekend tournament in which you would be debating where you have to argue one side and present an intelligent argument with an evidence-backed intelligent Mm -hmm. argument and then do it for the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, that's not what I see on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and kind of the, the major area where people are digesting their their news their history their politics i i don't see that that often yeah oh yeah i i definitely agree with you 
um, whether neutrality was already like in my blood, as you would say, or whether I earned or I nurtured it, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm very passionate about the things that I believe in, and I find it very hard to uh, to agree with another person's point, but that has never stopped me from understanding where they come from. So I, I think in that sense, um, I am neutral, meaning it's hard to persuade, to persuade me to join your side, but I can definitely understand where your side comes from. Um, You're willing I, to hear someone out, which a lot of people are not. Um, if my word neutrality is not the most appropriate, please, uh, I'm open myself to, to, to demonstrate what we're talking about. I'm open to another term that, that you could think of, but to describe like what you're saying, maybe it's empathy or the willingness to hear the, mm. the trait openness to be able to hear out the logic behind someone else's the uh, curiosity. I don't know, is another term we could use. I don't know if you have another word for it. I, I think neutrality is good. Um, although sometimes it might be confused for someone who doesn't take a side. Um, but I understand what you're saying. And I think our viewers, your viewers would understand, I guess also the definition, but yeah, uh, I think that person would be more nonchalance or indifference mm. that that's also yeah but i think regardless of the semantics we understand the substance behind it um and i think debate has helped with that um and you know as to the point that you're talking about with the straw man versus the iron man one of the things i learned early on in middle school uh and i carried it with me really even now as a rising senior um this thing from john stuart mill um in his book on liberty when he's talking about why it's important for the minority to be able to have a voice, the, this idea of the, the diversity of ideas, he points out and makes the same point you're making. And that is truth can only be truth if we can be able to, to, to show its worthiness amongst lies, right? So we need to have other ideas, strong ideas, backed ideas that contradict it, that go against it so that the truth can show its truthness. You know, if there's only one opinion, then there's no way for us to know that it's true or false. Light needs dark in order for it to be seen as light, um, white with black, so on and so forth. So I definitely like this idea of being able to challenge. It's just like, I'm pretty sure, you know, when you come up with a thesis, people have to challenge it, right? You have to show its worthiness. When a, in some cultures, when a child grows up to show its manhood, it has to fight. The child has to fight. So these things being able to teach our ideas to fight. I, li I like that idea, making it worthy, yeah. As a lifelong martial artist, a practitioner of jujitsu and Taekwondo and a future practitioner of Muay Thai or Thai boxing, I absolutely love your your illustrations. It's, it's cinematic. In my head, I was picturing the ideas engaging in combat sports and I loved it. So there is a point to speak of this conflict where you you had maybe a conflict or a second guessing of the activity or maybe just the direction in which the activity was headed. Right now, you're a rising senior, as you said, and you're no longer in that activity. What what was it that led to that decision making? And and maybe it was a time, I don't know if it was a time uh, cost benefit analysis or, or what it was, or if it was ideological. Uh, well, it's a variety of things. Um... I guess we could cover them one by one. I'll start with this idea um, of where debate is going, like in leading, especially I think in the West Coast. Uh, I mentioned this before. Debate at this point has divided into two styles, at least in high school. There's this thing called flow debate and there's this thing called lay debate. Uh, and in the West, all the great minds of debate, like all the best debaters are on the flow track, right? Lay is left usually for these league tournaments, right? Where people, first time debaters that, you know, they're novice, they, they go to the lay, kind of the lay side of debate. Uh, and the flow side of debate, I don't really think does justice to the, to the ideals and values of debate. Um, one of the things, for instance, I took issue with is this idea of spreading. Uh, I did not like what spreading. Can you say what that is? Tell them what spreading okay. is. I talked about that a little bit with my, uh, my friend, Jonathan Rios, who was president of our speech and debate team. Yeah, spreading is this what you're speaking as fast as you can, essentially. Uh, and it employs this use of the double breath. Uh, I never the United that. States federal government, and they are what are they doing? And the yeah, yeah, yeah. value that we are going. 
Yeah, and they do this thing also like the double breath, like like that, like like they're like hyperventilating or something. Um, <laughs> and they crack in like four hundred words, five hundred words in a minute. It's a and, yogic practice, probably. And the <laughs> the best the best of the spreaders, you can't understand anything. And so what's happened is, public speaking has gone out the window. Like you know, in flow debate, no one cares about speaker points. Speaker points really, you get higher speaker points when you win. Yeah. And so, you, you've uh, won at least one multiple awards for speaking. Yes. Uh, yeah. I've gotten first place, you know, uh, speaker awards in high school in my first year and plenty in eighth grade. I won, um, you have gavels, right. For the first place speaker. I got them at almost every single tournament. Um, but that went out the window in high school, this idea of employing pathos timing, these things that are, that are key uh, to <laughs> to good speaking went out the window. And so then what happens is everyone's spreading all over the place. So then they give the judges and the other teams uh, their file with all the things they're reading. And so at that point you say, what even is the point of speaking? You might as well just read in silence. Just right? email them your files. Just email them the file, exactly. Of your evidence. And then you type in your reputations and then you email and for it. those who haven't been on the judging side, as I have, the judge is supposed to be taking notes of what people are speaking about. And so because some of us judges have been enculturated into this culture of spreading that Deacon Mahirat is talking about, you know, I, I can understand it. But I think the, the larger point is that there's a popular audience, you know, the parents, the family members, whoever else may be there, school teachers, whoever else is involved. And if they're less involved than the people who've participated in the activity, it would not be intelligible. And as he said, the people who've perfected this particular skill, which means they've gamed the system uh, with the rules that stand, they're not cheating, but yeah. they are pushing the rules to the letter of the law rather than to the spirit as we would say in religious language that is lathered with the King James English. And, and they're abusing the spirit of the rules of the game. So you, you said you didn't, that didn't sit right with you. And what I love is a lot of people critique something and they do nothing. They sit on their laurels and they twiddle their thumbs, mm. but you did not do that. You critiqued it through your action you said i am critiquing this activity so rather than just complaining and crying and wailing i'm gonna create and craft my own space my own activity and it's such a beautiful thing and it's what i'm trying to do with this platform so you created your own platform tell us the name of it and and what kind of was the reasoning behind why you made that yeah, so the name of the club is Civil Discourse, and that's like a very vague thing. You can apply that to anything. But I like that phrase, Civil Discourse, because that's exactly what I'm aiming for, and that's what I, I think drew me to debate. It's this idea where you can discourse, discuss with other people, with other thinkers like you, uh, and bring forth ideas in a civil manner. It's not arguing. It's not even debating. You're not even trying to prove the other person wrong. Uh, it's just a symposium, if you would. I don't, I don't know what you would call it, but it's a meeting of minds. It's a discussing. Um, I think some of the best places, uh, maybe, are you frozen? No, oh. I hear you. Oh, right. You said it was a symposium? Yeah, I guess you could call it. I don't know what you'd call it, but it's like a meeting of minds, I think, is the best way to call it. Um, I think some of the best places for civil discourse have occurred in, you know, like cafes, restaurants. <laughs> uh, we were great thinkers come and they just discuss over food, over drinks. And I was trying to, to kind of bring that informal environment of, you know, peaceful and civil discussing uh, into a more formal environment where people could say, oh, this is an area where I can civilly listen to other people's opinions, bring forward my opinions uh, and inform myself about not just opinions, but the people behind the opinions, their experience, what led them to the embracing of that opinion. I think oftentimes we're so focused on the argument, on the assertion, on the claim or opinion, whatever you want to call it, that we forget that there's a person behind it. So it's worth us inquiring as to how did you come about to this opinion? What led you to that opinion? Because I think that can give us a lot of insight um, into the opinion um, by personalizing it, humanizing it, 
Uh, and above all, using that term you already raised, um, empathy. Empathy. Yeah. So that's the yeah, whole. So in, in my graduate studies, my discipline was what was called at the time alternative dispute resolution. And right now what's simply called dispute resolution. And the foundational idea is that we have all of these processes, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, litigation, legislation, all these shuns. And when these things break down, these informal and formal processes, what is left is what Hobbes would call the state of war. Mm. It's fisticuffs. People fight. It's what you see when Antifa and the Proud Boys, you know, punch the Nazis and punch the, the Pinkos or the Commies. You know, they just get into fist fights. And sometimes it goes beyond fist fights where we saw, you know, like in Charlottesville, psychopaths driving actual vehicles into um, crowds. And that one's intentional. I don't know if it was intentional. It seems accidental, perhaps. But there was a Habasha who did something recently in the Northwest, in Seattle. And I think this happens when the discourse, when the civil discourse you're talking about, this kind of dialogue, this foundational building blocks of society are gone. Again, this is why I have this platform. Everyone who's on here doesn't have 100% agreement. People have so many different ideas. But the one basic thing everybody who's on this platform agrees to is, if not the supremacy, at least the, the role and importance of conversation, of mm -hmm. dialogue. And so I really appreciate, again, like that you made this space for that. Now, I'm, I'm interested to hear, you said there were no debates or arguments. H how many of the people... Also, given you've, you've mentioned the West Coast a lot of times, right? The milieu or setting in which we're in. How many people had disagreement or how much disagreement was there? How much diversity intellectually was there in the civil discourse club that you brought up? And, and what sort of topics did you discuss? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'll start with the first. Uh, and that's where there are disagreements. The answer is yes. Obviously, there were disagreements. Um, I think it was very hard for me to find an intellectual diversity in my school because where I come from, I live in Santa Monica, which is in Southern California, in California, in the West Coast. So that's a bubble within a bubble within a bubble, right? We're on the, like, the left, 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 left. So to, to first off, the endeavor of being able to coax out the centrists, the conservatives, the people that don't share the majority opinion in my school was tough. That was an ordeal in and of itself. And then learning how to settle uh, and resolve those arguments um, was also uh, its own endeavor. But I think it was as it was not as hard as I envisioned it would be, or as I thought it would be, um, because I think people oftentimes they don't really want to argue. You know, they get carried away. You know, they uh, and I feel like if someone can step in and say, "No, this is not the time. This is not the place." And if you have multiple people say, yeah, this is not the time, this is not the place, then I think people can be calmed down. Uh, and I had the, the, the luck of getting a lot of people that didn't want to argue, um, people that didn't come to, to prove the other person wrong. So for me, it went quite smoothly. But of course, there were arguments. Uh, a lot of the topics we discussed um, were topics that were designed. For controversy, <laughs> I picked them. And I knew people would disagree on them. For instance, uh, you know, the topic of of abortion, um, the topic of police brutality, of racism. These are things that a lot of people have a lot of mixed views on. Um, like, for instance, you know, with abortion, definitely, you know, the whole spectrum of going, you know, from pro life to pro choice uh, renders a lot of different arguments. Um, the say the sanctity of life, the woman's right to choose. These are different, you know, different big issues that were brought up into the discussion. Uh, in terms of police brutality, you know, ACAB versus Blue Lives Matter. You know, those are two different, you know, parts of the spectrum and everything between. All those different things. Um, and people don't have to Google some of those things to know what they mean. <laughs> oh yeah, I can clarify just briefly. 
ACAB is this um, phrase which stands for all cops are bastards. And Blue Lives Matter, as you know, is a slogan that was created, I guess, in response to the movement of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so the two of them, I think, you, you can feel free to choose whatever you want. Uh, each one has its own truth. Each one has its own experience. And there's also, I always want to stress that there's also a bunch of opinions between mm -hmm. these two. Um, another one, an interesting one I brought up was um, the Asian American uh, lawsuit against Harvard University. Uh, oh, yeah. on action. For me, as saying that they were being discriminated against. Discriminated against, yeah. For me, as a as a black man, I was always very confused about how to feel about this, because you know, on one hand, I feel like affirmative action has its benefits. You may disagree, but I feel like it has its benefits in being able to raise African Americans and other minorities that are. Um, you know, that are put down to raise them at the same level as, as others. And then also I understand where the Asian American group is coming from, you know, because a lot of them, you know, this is not stereotyping at all. They, it's been proven that they've been getting, you know, high ac academic achievements. And we've seen evidence of how some schools uh, have, you know, rejected some people of, you know, of that background who had the higher scores, had the higher academic achievements in favor of another group of minorities, say African Americans or Hispanics, whatever the case is. Um, so that was an interesting one to see people's opinions. I whether think I would uh, I would add a nice monkey wrench into a lot of these debates. As for the pro-life, pro-choice, I don't know if you've ever come across Dal Dr. Walter Block has what he calls evictionism. And he has this belief that he's an evictionist, but then goes pro-choice until the science is perfected. I would be likely an evictionist that goes pro-life until the science is perfected. And so his his third avenue view to to flesh out the spectrum that you're talking about is that it's not, a, 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 and to talk about, again, what left to left means sometimes the words left and and right there you know it's hard misnomer it's like by left by the far left spectrum do we mean stalin or do we mean anarchists because those are different things mm -hmm. you know do we mean bernie sanders or do we mean uh someone like mm, i don't know who'd be a, a good example maybe ralph nader or dennis kucinich um and, and even those aren't the best examples but like there there's a there's a difference between someone who maybe wants to use left ideas through the state as a vehicle or so in a centralized fashion versus someone who has left ideas that they would rather see come about in a decentralized fashion perhaps okay. either with the state or with a um, a minimal state so anyway his evictionist position is that the woman doesn't have the right to kill, as a lot of people would say, but has the right to evict. And so the de facto thing, given the science now, is that that would lead to death. Um, but there's like, but but the distinction is that you cannot evict and then kill. Like you don't have once once the eviction is done, you don't have the right to like hunt down in the way you know Zimmerman would have hunted down. Trayvon so many years ago. And uh, uh, the idea there is that if the science got good enough and the the fetus was viable through eviction, they wouldn't have the ability, let's say, like with the analogy that some dense people make, I, I had I'd mentioned one judge I had come across was so callous that they said it was it was the same thing as clipping your toenails, you know, the act. Um, so that showed you, you know, kind of the 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 level of the activity they were being. And like you said, there's a spectrum of first trimester, second trimester, third, third trimester. And um, in, in terms of uh, wh what was it? There was ACB and police. Sorry, I, I missed my thought. What was it? And there was a, there was a different, there was a different discussion or debate too. Uh, I was mentioning with like police brutality, there is ACAB and blue lives matter, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, God, there was another one too you had mentioned. Uh, affirmative action. Affirmative okay. action. Thank you. Affirmative action. Another monkey wrench I would throw into the affirmative action discussion is a lot of times 
people are worried about, you know, is it a meritocracy or is it reparations that we're doing? And I think the biggest issue is actually the that a lot of this stuff is because of the federal funds that a lot of universities receive, which makes them subject to federal law. And some of the biggest things is there are about six or seven organizations that accredit universities, basically creating a monopoly, or you can say an oligopoly of occupational licensing that that invalidates other universities because they don't have a physical library, because their physical space isn't as big, because they don't have this many bathrooms, because they don't have a sports team, things which are quite arbitrary. And I think it's not just one solution. I, in a lot of things, I think I don't see just one solution for all of those things. Like, is affirmative action good or bad? You know, I wouldn't say whether it's good or bad. Yeah. I would like to see a lot of universities trying out different things. Mm -hmm. um, because the people who say affirmative action are bad, you know, I've heard some of them make arguments to the effect that it's difficult for some of the people if they didn't achieve academically to get into that situation. And maybe they would have been better off, had better self-esteem and, and better careers had they gone maybe to a less prestigious university. At the same time, the people who say it's good are talking about how there were people who are literally, especially ADOS, right? African descendants of slaves who are literally marginalized by the state. And so the state owes them some right. sort of, of restitution and, and reparations. And then the question is, you know, is it ad infinitum? Is it forever until ages of ages? Or, you know, are there, are there limits on, on the time span where we're talking about these restitutive or restorative processes. So yeah, so 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 thank you for for doing that. And what what was your role in the civil discourse club? Like, are you just one amongst the many people engaging in these discussions, or are you a facilitator, a leader in some sort, the the kind of arbiter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so ninth grade debate, uh, I finished. Then summer, I was accepted to this uh, organization called Seeds of Peace. They're located in Maine. Um, so I went there and they had a camp for, I think, about three weeks. Um, it's the organization's dedicated to conflict resolution. So what they did was they put you in these dialogue huts. Uh, and every day you'd go there and for, I think, around two hours, they'll put you with a bunch of people, you know, that you're very much at odds with. Um, people that they know, because, you know, they have your form, they know where you stand. And so they will on purpose put you with other people. And so they have professional facilitators who, who facilitate discussions. And me, uh, you know, I had yet to learn more about civil discourse. I was a competitive, right? I was the kind of person that was, let me hear you very much. I want to listen to your opinion, but I'm not going to be persuaded. So that means to my turn to destroy your argument. So I didn't like this idea of dialogue. Uh, and so I very much remained attached, especially, you know, as a religious person, seeing, hearing some of the things that were being said in that dialogue cut. I mean, there are people at the very, very, very opposite of the spectrum um, in all, like in almost every single aspect to me, uh, you know. Uh, so it was very hard. But finally, I saw the change in people, you know, like, like there was an emotional change in the people in that hut over the course of those three weeks, people that like had hated each other became like friends, you know, they became like brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was they did these different challenges. Like, you know, they made you hold hands with someone that you had argued with in a dialogue hook <laughs> while you're standing, you know, while you have to walk on a, like a wooden beam that's like 50 feet up. So Lord have mercy. <laughs> What's that? I said, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Or like, you know, you go kayaking in the lake with someone or with a group of people, whatever the case is, or canoeing, not kayaking, canoeing. Uh, so these different things really opened my eyes. Uh, and so then the big day for me was the final day of Seeds Hard Camp. You had grown men, you know, 17, 18 year old, like basketball players, football players from Detroit, from Chicago, people that you never see, you know, vulnerable were crying their eyes out while they were leaving the camp. And I was, I think, 14 at the time. And I'm like, man, how crazy is it? Like, you know, what we couldn't do to them or what no one could do to them physically, 
they were able to you were able to do with words you know by being able to show our experiences and listen to their experiences uh and so that's what when i made up my mind that i had to open up something that could share a shred of the experience that i had felt at that camp uh and so when i when i got back to la they had a uh, they had branches of seeds in all the big metropolitan cities and so they gave out seminars um these they flew out these professional facilitators and they taught us how to do what we had you know experienced at the camp and so i think there was two seminars you had to do to become a facilitator um and so i took those i learned facilitation and so when i opened up the club I decided to serve the role as a facilitator, someone that could be able to lead the discussion, um, see how people were doing, kind of de-escalate if there are any arguments taking place, uh, bringing new issues, right? Because sometimes it's dangerous to leave uh, a group of people open with nothing to talk about, like or anything to talk about, kind of guiding them into what issue we're going to explore today. So these are all things that I do and that I did, yeah. That's so beautiful. I didn't realize how much of my field that you had entered into as a as a side hustle. I love that. Oh my God. I'm excited to see you when you're beyond a rising senior, when you enter into the collegiate atmosphere, hopefully post corona and and yeah. see what what that's going to be like. In in the meantime, during this pandemic, um, has a lot of this stuff gone out? Or ha have you been in touch with any of those people or been able to do anything in the digital space or has, has it kind of been paused? Uh, yeah, usually we pause during summer break. Uh, I mean, we had gone a little bit late into June uh, because I, I knew that we had to talk about the protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, and school was closed, right? I mean, because from like March-ish or no? Oh, school had been closed, but we had gone online. Yeah. So we arranged um, via Google Meet, as you're doing now, um, with people. Uh, and, you know, I had been slow to get into it, to my fault. But people were DMing me and texting me like, you know, you got you to start this up. Because, you know, these protests are going on. The whole America is going through like a revolution. It was crazy. Uh, seeing the fires, seeing people looting and marching, whether that's good or bad. I mean, there were good and bad things that happened at that time. So, uh we had we held some of those in June. Um, even some teachers came along. Some teachers came in. They wanted to join the civil discourse thing, uh, and so that was nice. But uh, I after that we didn't really have any civil discourse. Like now we're in July, we haven't done any of that because. But that's beautiful. March to June, you did it. Yeah, we did. We did. Wow, and and the teachers are not coming in as chaperones, but as just members, right? Yeah, that's one of the things I stressed uh, um, in opening is we don't want anyone to teach us right? <laughs> um it's just everyone's here to share their ideas and i have to say the school i come from is very 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 progressive not in the, in the political sense but in the educational sense mm -hmm. these teachers are very open to learning from students from learning alongside students uh, they're not the kind of people that like you know look down at you um it, is like, it an independent school or a public district it is an independent school um and so a lot of the teachers have already from my early age ingrained in me these values of civil discourse and they piece together by sophomore year uh so uh for instance in addition to the club i might add uh in cooperation with the administration at my school i made civil discourse a class that people could oh take my God. amazing uh, and even in that class the teacher serves as a as an advisor as someone that's there to make sure everything's good but it's the, the kids that do the work um it's us the students so I love that part about civil discourse. And I think that's what, what's made civil discourse uh, so not chaotic. Because in my classes where there are teachers, there's always cross-talking, there's interruptions, people are always, you know, kind of doing their own thing. And I realized when I opened the club that really what the problem is, is not that people are distracted, but that people kind of have a disdain for authority. <laughs> so when you have one, one person from among yourself, you know, a first among brothers, who's just facilitating and opening up for you to speak, then you're like, oh, this is my place. So I'm responsible for what's going on as well. So you feel like the authority has been shared with you. And so then, um, yeah. then you go away. It, it's usually a farce in the university setting, but they refer to that concept as shared governance. 
and you feel a, a sense of uh, ownership of it. The idea in the university level, again, it's usually a sham and a farce, but the idea is that there's this hierarchical or stratified set of presidents and vice presidents, but that the faculty and the staff have some sort of say as well in the in the leadership that that goes on. And so, you know, there's some pretending about who's listens to who, but in your setting and, and part of that may be scale, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, 20, 30 people or less versus yeah. like thousands of people, 18,000 people. It's hard, it's hard to scale that level of, of intimacy. It's, it's why I think direct democracy works greatest in villages mm. and not so much over 300 million people. For and sure. it's some of the warnings that the founding fathers had in, in their own documentation. 1776 was not the beginning of democracies. The ancient Greeks, as we know from history and through reading, had experimented a lot with their various uh, paropolises and, and, uh, and cosmopolitan areas with various forms of democracies and, and republics. I, I want to get into, I think, a, a very interesting thing that you began recently. But before I, I get into that, I think the, the best segue would be, can you tell us, are there any differences, whatever, or could you compare and contrast for us the Civil Discourse Club as you met face-to-face -face versus when it was in Google Meet or here in, in the digital space? What, what, what was the same? What was different? Um, well, I, I, can, I, I don't know. It's interesting comparing them. Um... Well, you see, everyone has their cameras on, the mics on. We're talking just like you and I are. So uh, you can feel that it's a person-to-person -person thing. But uh, that's surprising, by the way, because I've been in a lot of different avenues and not everybody turns their mic on. I was in like a meeting just a day or two ago and it's like half-half or less. Yeah, yeah. But I think what's different, I guess, is there's just something I can't really put my finger on it. But there's something about just physically being in the presence of other people, that's just different. And also, you know, from the technological standpoint, being able to segue from one person to another person speaking can be a little like awkward, you know, uh, versus when you're physically with someone, you can take the cue that someone has stopped talking and you can open your mouth and speak. It's a little different when you have lagging and the time's a little different. But uh, besides that, I think we were very successful with the transition of civil discourse to digital for the last couple of months of, of school. That's wonderful to hear. I had heard someone do a science project one time and the figure they came up with was that 70% of language is nonverbal. Now I'm with you and I, I love the video chat again. I have this platform for that sake because I think it's the next best thing to face to face. Yeah. And I don't know how much of the ground of 70% is covered by video chat. But I assume it's some amount of that ground, whether it's half or most, and that there is still, like you mentioned, some cues, some nonverbal cues, which are a form of language themselves that are exclusive to face-to-face -face communication. So the segue I have for that is that I think the greatest amount of cowardice, the greatest amount of dehumanization and demonization happens when people are anonymous, there are phenomena that have been studied for years that when people put masks on, this is why you have masquerade balls, that people act more promiscuously and scandalously because they feel as if they cannot be seen. And mm -hmm. in the same way, when people are anonymous, when they have pseudonyms and when they have anime pics or random pictures instead of actual AVs of their face and their actual legal names, the way that they behave is very different when they feel they're not being watched. When you see someone walk into a liquor store and you have a video camera with the smile you're on camera, whether it's actually recording or not, because it's an expensive process not to throw it out every two weeks. Or when you see a cop car, whether it's empty or not on the side of the street, the way that you behave is different. I think even Baudrillard, a, th a thinker who was brought up a lot in debate when I was in debate, had this idea of, I think it's called the panopticon, right? Of a prison where you have the cell tower in the middle and whether or not there's a guard watching you, there's always the potential that the yeah. guard is watching you. And so the panopticon, again, affects the way that you behave. So mm -hmm. I have found a lot of vitriol and I have always believed firmly that there's something wrong in social media. 
And so for a while, I didn't want to participate. But about a few years ago, I went hardcore all in because I realized this is where the people are. And for me not to be here is for me to say that they're not worthy of communication. They're not worthy of being heard and spoken to, as, as you and I mentioned earlier. For a long time, you were not on social media. Yeah. Uh, perhaps for similar reasons. Could you tell us why you weren't on social media and why you've now made an appearance and have been blessing our timelines? <laughs> uh, I, I just felt... For me, it was more of a personal thing. It wasn't this kind of ideal thing. I, I just felt social media was a waste of time. Um, and I was scared that it was going to take up my time because seeing people in my school, you know, on Instagram all the time, I felt like, you know, I, I don't have time for that. Uh, I, I came into high school with a mindset to focus on my work, get stuff done, you know, be at the top of whatever I'm trying to be at the top of, uh, and then everything else can follow. And so I just felt like social media would be an obstacle to that. But uh, I joined Instagram later on for the for the same thing. You know, if we want to influence our communities, we have to do it where the people are at. Uh, you know, preaching or teaching or talking or discussing or hanging out with a blank wall won't do anything. So all these things we're doing, all these verbal communications, all these things that we're trying to do, only work when there's people. So you know, I decided to join the social media social media community. I guess you could call it. Uh, to be in touch with people. Uh, I still understand and I'm very, very aware of the flaws uh, and the dangers of what happens when we become too reliant or addicted to social media. Uh, but, you know, I, I've made sure to make sure, you know, to go into social media with the simple intention of influencing positively, sharing my ideas. Yeah, so that's that's why I joined. I, I love that. And it shows the sheer confidence in the power and the potency of your ideas as we've been talking about. And, you know, uh, how, how could I phrase this? I have a theory and I, I'm going to ask you uh, some questions that I think will point to my theory. And then we could have a, uh, an interesting kind of talk about that. Mm. So I have a theory there may not be so many people quite like Deacon Mehrat Malaku at your school, even though it's a nice progressive independent school in the city of angels that we've grown up in. So how many right Orthodox Christians would you say there are at your school and in your larger friend and network group? Widen that out to how many Orthodox Christians, be they in our communion or in the Greek communion, widen that to how many Catholics, you could even widen it out to Anglicans and, and other types of Protestant Christians who genuinely believe in the faiths that they are in rather than just people who go through the motions. How, how many people would you say are, are in any of those groups? Does that include people I'm friends with at church, people I communicate with at my church? If they're your peers. Amongst your peers, yeah. I'll, I'll accept it at our church as well as in your school. I'm more interested in your school network oh, and, school. and the, the network, but but you can include peer any peer just amongst your peers uh, that that I talk to face to face or online as well. Both, 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 both. I don't know how many. Uh... And uh, please estimate. We don't. We don't okay. need. This is not a sort of a scientific study. I think. Uh, I've had the opportunity of going to different places across the country uh, for religious purposes to get in touch with the church communities there. Uh, and there's plenty of brothers and sisters out there that I've come in touch, uh, both in America and also in Canada. Shout out to Toronto. So uh, the peers, uh, I don't know, I would guess maybe it's not even that much, but maybe like, I don't know, 50, 50, 60 of people in the, in the good is right, Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Christians. To be honest, and I feel like this is something I need to change. I don't know any Orthodox Christians outside of of the Giz communion, communion. So I think that's something I need to work on, getting in touch with our Coptic brothers and sisters, uh, Syrian, uh, Malankar Indian. Uh, I do have some peers from the Eritrean via online. Um, but That's uh, why I said Giz is right, because for me, the Eritrean distinction is a political one. Yeah. It's not... It's not really 
a liturgical one. So is right refers R I T E refers to the kind of the rituals, the liturgy, the books. I have heard that even today, after 20 plus years of political independence, the Eritrean church does not have what's called biluyat, right? The old Testament scripture interpret uh, interpretive tradition or the, the biblical school of Aksum that is in Eritrea does not have it in Tigrinya. To this day, they are interpreting the scriptures in Amharic and in Ge'ez. I've heard that they have the Haddisat or the New Testament translated so that mm. they say it in Ge'ez and in Tigrinya as opposed to Ge'ez and Amharic. But I'm sure some of them are still doing it in Amharic too. And some yeah. of them are just crossing the border. You know what I mean? Because it's it's literally the same tradition. It and is. it really is a political. It's not to, to put down our Eritrean brothers and sisters but it's you know it's not a unique situation. It is part of the same uh, tradition as referring to the Orthodox Christians of yeah. Eritrea, not not the other faiths. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely for sure. Uh, I like that. Good is right. That's great. Um, but yeah, in terms of of other Orthodox Christians, I haven't had a communion. Uh, you know, like you know, uh, what's it called? Communication with them. Although I think now going to college, I think after a year, I'm going to go into college. I think I, I want to. Uh, reach out and network with people from again, like I said, Coptic, Indian, um, Syrian. Who else do we have? Armenian, 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 and then also with Eastern Orthodox, not just Oriental, but the Greeks. Uh, who else are there? The Russians, the Slavs, yeah. and basically the Greeks and the Slavs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I basically just refer to the communions. This is a funny, just a, an aside for our religious fans, but the way I refer to the communions is I refer to our communion at large as the Afro-Asiatic communion because mm. of the two base languages in the Sea of Antioch and the Sea of Alexandria, which are Coptic and Syriac. Mm. And both are within the Afro-Asiatic language branch. And that's mm. the basis of the liturgies and of the traditions. Then the other communion is the Greeks because even though you have the Slavs who, who use church Slavonic and the other local vernaculars, the basis of them all come from Byzantium. So mm. all of their basis is g is Greek. And so you'll notice they translate a lot of stuff, but they actually have more of a monoculture because mm. the basis of everything is just their one right. Whereas you look in our tradition, we have a uh, unique g is right, which is highly based on the Coptic right, but also the Syriac right. We mm. have a unique Syriac right, a unique Coptic right. The Armenian right develops from a base of the Syriac right. And the Indian right is straight up the Syriac right as well. So yeah. that that's at least what, like three or four, potentially five, depending on how you count it, different rights. Whereas in the Eastern Orthodox, it's basically the Greek light right translated into different languages, but there's mm. not really a different right. And then the Roman church, you know, you could either call it the Roman right or the Latin right. So that, that's, that's the way I typically think about it. Are you talking about Eastern Catholics? No, the Eastern Catholics are whatever they're from. So for example, the Eastern Catholics, there are Greek right mm. people. And so I would consider them Greek right who just happen to submit to the Roman bishop, but okay. their, their actual, their icon, their icons, the way their church is, the language of their liturgy, it's all Eastern. Even the practice of having married priests, it's all Eastern. So mm. I would still consider them under Greek right. It's just that they happen to be submitting to the Roman bishop. Um, but I mean, people of the actual Western, right? The actual yeah, yeah, Latin, yeah. Latin. Yeah, okay. exactly. And then the Protestants, you know, are their own entity. Uh, yeah. So how about how many Roman Catholics or, or, or Protestants? Uh, you mean like devout, like uh, people that observe? Yes. People, not people who were just born into it, but people yeah. who affirm it. And the in answer some I sense. I don't want it. you to apply a purity test to them, but yeah, yeah, just yeah. in some sense that they... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the answer is zero. Same goes with Protestant. Um, you know, Protestant is first off. The funny thing is something that made me laugh. Uh, going into middle school and high school, when you know, when I ask people, "Oh, what's your faith?" They say, "I'm Christian," and then I say, "Oh, okay. So, are you Protestant?" And they say, "No, I don't know what that means." <laughs> and ninety-nine out of a hundred of those people that say I'm Christian, they're Protestant. But uh, there's been this conflation between Protestantism and Christianity. A um, devilish one. And when and, and and another thing that's so funny made me laugh is th there's people who think that Catholicism is a separate religion outside of Christianity. 
Uh, and I'm blessed to have, you know, grown up understanding the different branches of Christianity. Um, but it just makes me laugh. Um, yeah. Cause to go back to your conversation about police brutality, you know, I don't, I don't buy into all of the progressive lexicon on the subject, but this idea of privilege that I think is valid is that when you are the marginalized person, you have to think about your blackness. Mm -hmm. You have to think about your queerness because you stand out from the crowd. You're different. Whereas when you are the majority, it's, it's, you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. So most often you don't think critically about the subject mm -hmm. so that most people who are Protestant do not self-identify as Protestant. Yeah. It is a label maybe that the original people would be comfortable with, but more used nowadays by their opponents and their adversaries. Mm -hmm. They would, I think, mostly identify as quote unquote, non-denominational Christians. Uh, that's another in a, it's an impossibility because- <laughs> you, ha you have you have certain stances on the sacraments. You have a stance on baptism. You either are for baby baptism or you're not. You have stance on the real presence in the communion, in the flesh and blood of, of Christ. Yeah. You have a stance on the priesthood. You have stances on all these things, on, on icons. So you inherently, on what, what prayers to use, what Bible you're using. Yeah. You, know, so you could be, I tell them, multi-denominational, mm. but you cannot, or you could be, mono denominational just one denomination or yeah. even bi denominational what you cannot be is non you can't be non partisan and you can't be non denominational you can't be non ideological you can have some sort of amalgamation of ideologies of partisanship and of denominations but you know, this idea that we're in uh, fukuyama's world where the current form of democracy is the end there will be no more wars as steven pinker tries to tell us um it's it's a fanciful view that i think worships the present and a more measured tone examines everything in the past examine everything in the present and and grasps the good as as saint paul would say so the reason i brought up all this line of thinking if you don't know where i'm going mm. is that a lot of the direction of your messaging the pre the presentation of your ideas. I've been again. I know you 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 laughed or guffawed at it, but uh, again, I don't give false praise. I'm just not in the business of that. I don't gain anything. I call a spade a spade. You've been blessing our timelines with holy imagery and reminding us of the monthly holidays, reminding us of the yearly holidays, and talking about these the matters that are above, as Kasis Diba Kulu uh, sang about on his album. Yeah. Think about the matters that are above. Is that Colossians? Or, yeah. Is that Philippians or Colossians? Which is, yeah. what is it? I forgot which one it is, but St. Paul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's St. Paul. It's a Pauline. And so, you think about the matters that are above and you present those things. So you're, you're thinking about them. You're speaking about them. You're doing them through your social media messaging. I I know this as someone who has been a, a sort of a, a pariah amongst my various friend groups and stuck out in this way. And it takes a certain amount of temerity because other people have a certain threshold of their peers doing the same thing that mm -hmm. they would need. And they would need immediacy of that. But you yeah. seem to be a voice alone in the wilderness. So I, I have to wonder and ask, what have been the reactions of your various friends who are not of the good is right? who are perhaps more secular, or I don't know if they're Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, or Hindu. Yeah. Um, I assume they're mostly secular, but they could be other things. Secular. What has been their reaction to this messaging? Uh, you know, uh, I had thought about it, you know, when I began first um, posting these kind of things, how are they going to think? Because the, the mihret that you see at school uh, <laughs> reveals nothing really about uh, the things he is outside of school. You keep your cards uh, close to your chest. Yeah, because I focus more just on on education, and then you know, on the usual, the game that happened last night, or you know, the movie that came out, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we talk about. It's not talk. usually not matters of orthodoxy. Yeah. Uh, the but, earthly things, the opposite of above, the below things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, I mean, I haven't gotten really much of a response. I think some people have DM me with questions about what's going on very interested about oh what's 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 this and 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 that and uh and i love that i'm really open to that uh for people to be open to that kind of thing 
Uh, but otherwise, you know, whoever listens, you know, what does Mark say? Whoever has an ear, let him hear. That's what, our, uh, that's what Christ said, and that's what the, our priest says in our right after he finishes reading the Gospel of Mark. Whoever has an ear, let him hear. Um, so my thing is, my target audience is people of my age, my generation, that are part of the Ethiopian Orthodox and Eritrean Orthodox Church, you know, the Abisha Orthodox Christian in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and if other people are, are curious about what's going on, I'm open to responding to them. But uh, I think my major calling is to the youth, the diaspora of Abishas in America that are part of the Orthodox. So it's fascinating. It's an, it's an internal view. I don't know if you know this. I spoke about this with my Bible study group, which I host on, on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And there are two main visions of two bishops. Abuna Isaac of blessed memory. I consider my spiritual grandfather because he's the spiritual father of our Abba Thomas Finley. And Abba Isaac was sent by his imperial majesty, the king of kings of Ethiopia, Emperor Haile Selassie, to ferret out this belief that Ras, the former Ras Tafari, is God, and instead replace it with genuine Orthodox Christianity of the good is right flavor. And he did that, but with a mission to these people who were functional Gentiles, to the people of the West, in the Caribbean and in North America. He established many parishes, including our parish, when it was originally called Tekla Haimanot in Los Angeles. And this was written about briefly in one of our epiphany journals or theophany journals by my aunt, uh, Goodest. And uh, Chris, Ato Chris, has said that he's going to try to accumulate some sources and rewrite this in a matter that could be dispersed digitally. Because a lot of people were curious about the history and didn't know about it. The mm. transition from Takla Haimano to Mariam and some of the differences that happened, the clash of cultures and civilizations with a predominantly black American and Rastafarian group that slowly gets more and more Ethiopian as more and more people immigrate to the United States. Mm. So Abba Isaac's vision is one that is outward facing. Mm -hmm. He's coming, what, in the 50s or 70s? I think in the 70s is when he first starts coming. And he's, you know, baptizing Bob Marley and 5,000 other people and establishing these churches everywhere. In the 90s, we get our blessed bishop, Abuna Melkes Edik, mm. who seems through his age alone to spite all the haters. His, you know, he was a grown man and an old man with a prestigious title when my parents in their 60s were children in Addis Ababa. And here he is, still our beloved archbishop. We still call his name in our liturgy. He's in Oakland. His vision was more internal facing, was the mission that you described. He looked at the situation, Mamhari Yaman at our church, for example, has mentioned several times, the numbers range between 20,000 and 100,000 for how many Ethiopians are in the greater Los Angeles area. Using the most conservative figure, 20,000, and using the most liberal figure for church attenders, you might come up with 5,000. And if 50% of those people are Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, that means we're missing out on at least 5,000 people mm -hmm. at a bare minimum. And yeah. potentially we're missing out on tens of thousands of people. If the number is actually 100,000, we're, we're missing on like 40,000 people who don't regularly attend. And so your vision is, you know, let's take care of that flock. And I respect both of those visions. I think we need to do both. I lean more towards the Abba Isaac vision. But what, I, what I'm curious about is that you say they are not responding, but for a few DMs. I think they're very important. And I want to encourage you to keep faithfully plugging along because it's a very beautiful work that you've begun. And I think these things work over time. I've had a lot of people reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, so many different avenues who've changed their view on politics and religion because they've seen me faithfully chugging along on some of these unique ideas that uh, ideas that are not necessarily the mainstream. And so I want to encourage you in your work, but I also want you to reflect on the idea that I assume these people are still following you because mm -hmm. the idea of following versus not following mm -hmm. the idea of maybe occasionally liking and not liking, maybe particip uh, commenting versus not commenting, mm -hmm. messaging you DM, like these are all various forms of communicating with you. So mm. I'm, I want you to reflect on, and, and maybe a little bit now, and maybe a little bit later, w are these people who are secular or mm. of other faiths, are they still following you? Do they ever occasionally like the things that you're doing besides just asking clarificatory questions? 
you say that one more time, the question? Yes. So you, you mentioned some people were entering your direct messages and asking clarificatory questions. You know, you might say, Ya warhu madhani alam no, and they're like, Oh, what's madhani alam? Maybe it's a clarificatory question like that. Or what is the Archangel Michael? Or who is he? You know, they might be asking something like that. Sure. But I'm wondering, are there secular people that you've noticed that are at least participating in the minimalist ways by following your account and maybe even occasionally liking it? Oh yeah, I mean on the, on my posts, like not the stories, but the you know the posts, there are plenty of secular people that like it. Uh, I don't know; it's because they like the content. Because I don't know who actually would read the caption. Because I have very lengthy, lengthy captions. I, I love that, by the way. I think it's more of just liking the person that made the post because they're they're people that are friends with me, you know, that I know them. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of people that had that kind of interaction. Um, like I said, though, the the reason behind that interaction is left unknown to God alone, whether it was because they were, you know, my friend or because they liked the substance um, of the post. Yeah. Well, I know your deep hope and my deep hope would be that it is the substance that they are believing in the most. But if that substance comes in the container of the Deacon Mehrat Malaku brand, then why not? If that's how God wants to send his message, his word of life, I'm, I'm pleased by it. And so I wanted to uh, thank you again for your time today. And again, we're going to bring you back to culture these folks on classical music and on so many other subjects. Sounds good. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dagon Hanok.